Berlin, September 1939. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. Poland's 34 million inhabitants, crushed, scattered, and enslaved. Tens of thousands of square miles of territory shrink before the movement of lightning-armored columns. Poland and the world learn the meaning of a grim new word, Blitzkrieg. The Nazi civilian Poland, our world collapsed. One of the first things they did is assemble some of our important people in the house where the German commissioner was sitting. The Germans right away introduced their laws. Jews are prevented from doing this and that, not allowed to participate in events, and they let us know that we are outside of the law. And things went from bad to worse. We were not allowed to get any food. We were not allowed to move around from here to there. So it was a tough life. We were isolated and uh, we lost our identity as people, which meant that whatever the Germans wanted, we had to deliver, we had to do, and follow every instruction that they gave us. The family remained in the state where we lived for a while until the Germans decided to evacuate us. I realized that things are not going to get any better. So I escaped the woods and I, eventually I, I joined a group of uh, partisans. One of the German soldiers left a rifle standing against a tree. They were in that area. When I saw that, I, I, I grabbed it and uh, a day or two later, I knocked on the door of a uh, lo local farmer and uh, he wasn't sure he wanted to let me in because if he lets me in, maybe he's cooperating with the Germans. Finally let me in. This is where I met the, the first partisans. I told them who I am and what, what, I, what I would like to do, and, and they accepted me. In the beginning, we didn't have anything. Slowly, we acquired weapons from attacks on the Germans. We captured some weapons, and then weapons came from the Russian army. We became more dangerous with the Germans, and we operated in that area. We used every occasion to harass the German army wherever we could. We had uh, set up ambushes. Our home became the forest, and we avoided entering any houses because there were people who were reporting to the Germans if they saw us somewhere. We would come in at night to a farmer's house and simply ask them for food. If they didn't let us find ways, we told them that they would pay a price for that. So they usually complied, and this is how we get our food. Farmers in the area knew already, if we knocked at the door, they better come out with some food to get rid of us as, as fast as I could. I wanted to fight the Germans. The only way to fight the Germans is to join the partisans. It was natural. Not too many people were able to make contact with the partisans. It was just simple. I managed to land in there, and, and thank God I, I made it out that I helped the rest of my family. My family is one of the only families who survived. My mother was the only mother who survived from my hometown because I managed to rescue her with the help of a, 
a local farmer. I got friendly with this farmer and we arranged that when his wife goes to market, my mother will find her. And then when they leave the market, my mother will sit down on the horse and carriage in the front as a third woman. And this is how they left the town. For another three years, I served the Russian army. So many years in, in the woods. So I got, I got an invitation to uh, join us. <laughs> it was not something that I wanted, but I, I had a little choice. And I was very proud that I could join now and, and fight back. And I made it as fast as I could to get out of Poland. And I wound up in Austria in a DP camp, displaced person camp. I found out that a friend of mine from before the war was in a barrack there somewhere. Well, before the war, we, were, we belonged to the, to, to the organization. And the, both of us participated in a seminar that the organization was in, in a town of Lodz in Poland. And now that I was told that he is there, so I went to see him. As I was coming to see him, a, a woman is coming out. I looked at her, she looked at me. I turned around, I just followed her. And that, that became my wife later. That became my wife, it became my life. She was, she was a, uh, I don't have the right words what kind of what kind of a person she was, but I I was very fortunate to meet after the war to meet somebody who was who gave me gave me a reason for life. After five years, we wound up going to the United States. We contacted our family in the United States and they provided us with uh, certificates that they are inviting us to join them in the United States. I became the head of the family for the fact that I was the oldest and they, fo they followed me. When she came to the United States, she had the word, I hate this, I hate that, I hate that. I don't understand it. If, if you don't like it, say, I don't like that. Why do you use the word hate? It becomes so cheap, you know? That, that, was her, that was her argument, she was arguing all the time. Why did I survive? Maybe the reason I survived was that I could tell my story. And tens of my friends, my, my friends, they were with me. They didn't survive. So I was very fortunate. People who deny the Holocaust, for them, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say to them. If they can deny the Holocaust, I have nothing to say to them. Period. It's evil, but in a different, in a different shape. It's, it's evil. Evil is evil. That's all I can tell you. Evil is evil. What, what does it take for people to, to understand what happened? You know, I'm, I'm simply at the lack of words to describe it, how I feel about people who they die, that this happened, this happened, this happened. When there are witnesses there who was there, we were there. If you have something of importance and you don't share it with anybody, it's a, it's a lost cause. If you 
can contribute something to history, you have an obligation to do it. So it's, there's no excuses. If we, if we didn't tell the story, who, who would? Who would?